Okay, so today we're going to talk about technologies for space transportation. So in other words, we're going to look at ways that we can either send things or even people up into space, whether it's for short term or whether it's for long term. We'll also talk about some of the things that we've already sent out into space, such as space probes to go vis visit other planets. Anyway, let's get rolling. So if it's going to let me change, there we go. So like I just said, the focus for today will be to learn about technologies used to get to space as well as for traveling through uh, space. Uh, we'll talk about rockets, satellites, space probes, space stations, as well as the future of space transportation, question mark, as to what on earth is going to happen with that. Anyway, let's get rolling. So, first of all, leaving planet Earth. To no surprise to hopefully any of you, getting to space is very hard. In order to get to space, we have to overcome something called escape velocity. That's just a fancy way of saying how fast you need to be going in order for you to leave Earth's gravity. Uh, the speed, the escape, the escape velocity, I should say, is about 28,000 kilometers per hour. So obviously you have to pick up quite a bit of speed in order to actually break away from Earth's gravity and enter orbit, or at least leave into space itself. Uh, now this is much too fast for anything on Earth to reach on its own, of course. With enough propulsion, something can gradually resist the pull of Earth's gravity and eventually work its way up to that kind of a speed. Uh, now, the further away from Earth, the lower the influence of Earth's gravity. So technically, just getting off the ground is the hardest part. Uh, as you get further and further up, the uh, force of gravity gets lower and lower and lower because it is an action at a distance. It depends on how far away from something you are for it to affect. So first of all, rockets. Uh, these are based, of course, off the principle of propulsion. So in other words, they burn fuel. It pushes down. There's an action reaction here. So in other words, when you push down, I think it's Newton's third law says that there must be an equal and opposite reaction. So that pushes it up. Uh, now, the fuel that they use is usually liquid hydrogen. It can also be things like liquid oxygen, uh, basically just any chemical that's going to burn super, super freely. Uh, that is usually uh, what's burned to create that huge amount of thrust, of course. Now, rockets. Believe it or not, rockets have been actually around for thousands and thousands of years, although it's kind of hard to call what this is a rocket. Uh, there was a Greek mathematician named, I believe you pronounce that Archytas, I could be mistaken, but he may have invented the first rocket, if you can really call it that, I'm going to put quotations around it, the first rocket around the year 400 BC, so well over 2,000 years ago here. Uh, what it was, it's actually quite entertaining, uh, it was a model pigeon, like it was literally just like made of like clay or something like that, it was a model pigeon, he filled it with water, um, but then he had like some little holes kind of at the bottom of it, when he filled it with water and then had these holes here, if he heated it by putting it above a fire and then he had like a string that it was attached to, he would notice that this thing would propel forward because the steam ejecting out the back end of this pigeon would cause it to push forward. Uh, he later adapted it, of course, by having it like a loose ring up here with a string attached to so that when this would start like pushing, it would actually travel along the string itself. Uh, so pretty cool, actually. That is technically a rocket, right? It is something that is being propulsed um, by some sort of fuel. In this case, the fuel would have just been the steam coming out the back end of that pigeon. Kind of cool. That's the first rocket. Now, of course, I don't think that guy ever would have thought that would have been making it to space. Um, but again, the principle of propulsion is all based around uh, the idea that for every action, there is an equal but opposite reaction. That's why when you push against something, it pushes back on you. Um, it's like, think about when you're swimming in a pool, and then you go up to the edge, and then you kick against the side of the pool to swim off the other way that's the entire reason right there's an action for every action there's an equal but opposite reaction so burning fuel pushes out as that fire escapes from the end of the rocket but that pushes back on the rocket itself which causes it to of course propel itself forward so pretty cool now next up going away from rockets we need to talk about satellites now before people were put in space of course countries made attempts to send up satellites they were just trying to get something to orbit around earth just to see if we could actually make it out there to send something to get into orbit the first artificial satellite in orbit was named sputnik it was actually launched by the soviet union soviet union sorry ussr uh, way back in 1957 uh, and this is like a model of it right here uh, it was about a basketball sized object and the whole purpose about it was to test to see if a satellite could transmit a radio signal in space and it worked. Uh, Sputnik actually I'm sure you could look up and hear what it sounded like it was just like this really eerie ping kind of noise it would go ping 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 as it was flying through space. Um, so quite fascinating and also very terrifying, especially to officials uh, in the West, knowing that the Soviet Union could put uh, some sort of radio device up in space. 
Now, the second country to send a satellite in space was, of course, the United States. They sent a, a satellite called Explorer 1 into space the next year. It was in 1958. Uh, and then here's what's kind of cool. The third country to send a satellite into space was Canada. Uh, they launched Alouette 1 in 1962. So we weren't far behind the Soviet Union and the United States in this regard. Uh, and again, the early satellites, the main point of this was radio communication. Uh, when something's way up in space, it doesn't have to be... Uh, you know, it doesn't have interference from any of the local surroundings on the ground. Uh, it's much easier to get a radio signal when it's hovering right above you. Anyway, moving on. Uh, a similar concept to space or to satellites is a concept called space probes. Uh, space probes are basically just a satellite that doesn't orbit Earth. It just gets sent somewhere else to go do something else, right? So it's a small but minor detail that you do need to know. Now, many probes are sent out into space to collect data and collect photographs. Um, especially in the last like 20 to 30 years, there's been a lot of space probes that have been sent out. Uh, matter of fact, is any photograph that you've ever seen of Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto must have been taken by a space probe, unless you're literally just seeing what looks like a star in the sky, in which case I'm sure maybe you are seeing something that was taken by something on the ground. Um, but any of those three planets slash dwarf planet there with Pluto, um, they are so far away, we wouldn't be able to take a photo of them unless we actually got up close to them. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. There were two big space probes, really, really important ones uh, that we can thank for this. They were both launched in the year 1977. One of them was called Voyager 1, and the other, of course, without much creativity, was called Voyager 2. Uh, now, as of September 2019, Voyager 1 has left our solar system, and it's over 22 billion kilometers away. Uh, so it, even though it has been flying through space for over 40 years now, um, you know, it is still going and going and going. And it is the furthest man-made object from Earth, of course, Voyager 2 would be the second furthest away object from Earth, but uh, still crazy to think it's been flying all that distance all this time. Now, with Voyager, Voyager's actually captured several very, very fascinating photos. The one up here in the top left, this is actually really fascinating for many reasons. This is one of Jupiter's moons. This is Io. Uh, Io, like I mentioned in the other video uh, from a couple of days ago, is the most volcanic object in the solar system. And what it actually captured as it was flying by Io as it was, of course, going around Jupiter, where Io is here, uh, they actually saw a volcanic eruption taking place on the surface of Io. That is brilliant timing. It is amazing they were able to capture that. And you can see the plume just spewing from the surface of Io. Like, this is huge. Think of the curvature of this moon here. It's crazy uh, just how much power there must be in that volcano to do something like that. Um, but still, Voyager caught that photo, uh, which, of course, is very fascinating. Um, this one, I'm going to have to apologize. I don't recall which one this is, but this is one of the moons, one of the planets out there. Um, of course, as you can kind of tell, it's a pretty boring looking surface. So it's probably a moon. This, of course, is Saturn. It's a very brilliant photo of Saturn, but you can also see in this photo, they caught some of Saturn's moons uh, in a sunbeam right here as well. So they were able to see some of the moons of Saturn as they flew by. Uh, and then this, of course, is Neptune, right? So we didn't actually know what Uranus and Neptune looked like uh, until Voyager came around and and took these amazing photos. So moving on. Now, another thing up in space, I'm sure you've heard of this one before, the International Space Station. Uh, the ISS is a shared research facility in orbit just above Earth. It is a joint project between 16 different countries, those 16 countries being United States, Canada, Japan, Russia, Brazil, and then several European countries, 11 of them all mixed together, mostly operating under a European flag, but then there's also the United Kingdom and stuff. But anyway, we'll move on from that. The International Space Station is uh, pretty interesting because it continues to grow and expand. They seem to constantly be adding new components and new modules to it. Uh, very, very fascinating, of course. Anyway, moving on. Uh, this is a video on board the International Space Station. I'll post it as a link uh, on Google Classroom, of course. The link right there is, is in there. Maybe I'll even also put it in the description of this video if I remember, um, but we'll watch that, uh, or you can watch that on your own time if you wish. Uh, as for the future of space transportation, question mark. Uh, we have a, kind of a challenge ahead of us. While the technology that we have to get around our solar system is reasonable, it still takes a very, very, very long time to get anywhere, even within our solar system, never mind beyond. Uh, so rockets are great for getting us to space, but what about going to great distances like to nearby planets or even to very distant stars? Uh, there's a few ideas that are kind of floating around. One experimental idea is an engine called an ion drive. Uh, and here's kind of how it works. It's pretty complicated, but the basic idea is there's xenon gas. Xenon is just an element on the periodic table. Xenon gas is electrically charged, and then it's accelerated in here 
Uh, and then of course those accelerated ions are emitted as exhaust. So it's like there's a gas swirling in here and it slowly releases the ion gas as it comes out. Now what's nice about this is this lasts for a very, very, very long time. You can get this going uh, using very little weight uh, and you can get this propulsing for a very, very long time. Uh, and that's kind of the key idea here. We need not only something that's gonna go very fast, but also something that's gonna be sustainable over a great distance. Perhaps an ion drive will do that for us, who knows. Uh, another idea, and this one's actually gained, I was gonna say gained wind, but that's gonna be quite, quite a pun from this. Another idea is something called a solar sail, right? This uses the solar wind, which is charged particles released from the sun uh, to catch on it and propel it forward. No different than the sail would work just on earth, right? As it would catch the wind and push it forward. Uh, this one has, uh, again, gained wind lately, uh, because I'm sure you've heard Elon Musk has been doing a lot of stuff with his company with SpaceX. Uh, there's been a lot of talk recently in the recent months uh, that he might be developing a solar sail that's actually effective. Now, here's why a solar sail is such a good idea, uh, at least in theory. You think a sail would be a pretty, uh, you know, archaic device, a pretty old fashioned device for doing something like this. But here's the, here's the trick in space. Uh, it is very slow at first because it's just catching very small particles from the sun that's pushing it forward. Uh, but there's nothing in space that slows anything down. It's not like on Earth where the air, the air like the wind resistance, is going to slow you down so you can't go a certain speed. Uh, in space, there isn't any you know air to slow you down. You're just going to keep going and accelerating and going faster and faster and faster. So even though this sail would be very slow to start, over a significant amount of time, it should be able to uh, theoretically pick up some speed. Uh, and go quite, quite fast, just on its own. Uh, so kind of cool. It is another idea that's floating around, who knows. Anyway, for practice, you can try page 417, questions one to nine. Um, I will also post that video on board the space station uh, for you to watch as well. You don't have to watch that one, but it is kind of interesting, just showing what life on board the International Space Station is like. Anyway, have, uh, have a good one on these ones, I guess. If you need any help, please reach out as always. Um, best of luck.